Good morning, Cove. Evan Welty here. Let me figure out the right height on my ladder. Uh, <laughs> I was in the attic looking for the Advent wreath, and then I thought, why not here? I could record the welcome to church from here. We've been in so many nice spaces in people's homes. Uh, here's a new one. So I have been going to the Cove for a while. If we've never met before, I am married to Matt Welty, and we have three sons. We have two boys who are uh, just about to turn 11 next week, Ian and Lucas, and then uh, Timmy just turned seven. So we've been a part of the church. I was pregnant with Ian and Lucas when we came, so a little over 11 years. And we just love being part of the Cove and uh, are so glad to be with you, especially when we can really be with you in person. But in the meantime, here we are. Anyway, uh, Dan asked if I could light the second candle of the Advent wreath today with my family. And then I came up here and figured, why not? We'll just start here. <laughs> so here is my attic and you know, everybody has their Christmas supplies. Got my Playmobil nativity here. And over here is, yes, the Advent wreath. We somehow never made it up here this week, but we're gonna start now. And um, <laughs> we used to decorate a little bit later for Christmas at our house, just because I have these two birthdays next week. Um, and so we kind of hold off and do the decorating after the birthdays, but it is Advent, so it's time to light a candle. Come with me. Hey guys, I got the Advent wreath out of the attic. So here we Thanks, go. Mom. Thanks, Mom. Thank you, Mom. Hey. Hello, guys. Hey. I'm Ian. And I'm Matt. I'm Lucas. I'm Jimmy Walty. Now I shall light our hope candle. Not <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be an advent wreath lighting if the lighter didn't shoot. Go ahead. There you go. Can you come down, please? We are in this season of Advent, a season of waiting. We wait for both the birth of Christ and we wait for the day when Christ will come again. Last week, the first advent candle reminded us that we wait in hope. Remembering that hope is not wishful thinking, but an assurance of a future because of God's action in Jesus. This morning we light the second candle, the candle of peace. We lighted the hope candle, now we light the peace candle. In the Bible, peace is not simply that, the absence of warfare, but a holistic peace. The peace that brings wholeness, security, and contentment. The peace that is available to us in Christ, that quiets our hearts and reminds us that we belong to God. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you said that you will give us peace, a different peace than our world has. Reveal yourself to us this day. We are in such deep need of your peace in our world, in our homes, and in our hearts. In your name, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. One more announcement. Uh, we're going to start worship together, but I wanted to mention that the Cove is hoping to have an outdoor in-person Christmas Eve service around five o'clock, December 24th at the Cove campus. But things are always changing because of the pandemic, so we'll see what happens, but stay tuned for more information there and we can keep hoping. Let's worship together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll 
worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then Oh, didn't see you there. My apologies. Welcome to Cove Kids. My name is Jacob Hayes, as many of you probably know, and I am here to fulfill an oath that myself and the Newberg boys took way back when to do one of the Cove Kids messages. We're really excited about what we have, and um, sit back, relax, and enjoy what we have prepared. Today, our story begins with a boy named Ryland. Rylan was just like most other kids. He liked to go outside and play with his friends. He did his best to obey his parents, and he always turned his homework in on time. And like most other kids, he had a dream. You know, some kids, they might want to be a firefighter. Maybe you want to be a doctor when you grow up. Maybe you want to be a nurse or a mailman or a number of different things. Rylan was different though. Rylan wanted to be a professional runner it all has to do with an inspiration that he had long ago from some local college students. 
part of an elite squad known as the George Fox cross country team. I want to be like those guys. And so, Rylan got to work on trying out for the George Fox cross country team. He picked up a running magazine and planned to read the entire thing taking ideas to make himself look like the best runner. Rylan got an expensive running watch to keep track of his workouts and even prepared an outfit for his first time trial race. Though he tried almost everything the magazine had to offer, some things just didn't quite work out. Nonetheless, Rylan continued to read and he learned more and more about running. He had the look of a runner and he knew how to act like a runner. And with all this preparation, Rylan was sure he was going to make a great impression at his time trial. Well, that was bad. Rylan was clearly out of shape. He was disappointed by his bad race, wondering how he could have messed up so bad after preparing so well. But, to his surprise, one of the great legends came to his aid. Hey, Rylan. So I saw your last race and uh, it wasn't very good. Yeah, I, I don't understand it. I, I mean, I read all there was to read about it. I knew everything about running. All the gear, I had the watch, the matching shoes and shirt. Why was I not good? So, um, Rylan, the gear for running is really important. Having the knowledge about what you need to know about running is really important. But at the end of the day, what makes a runner a runner is that he actually goes out and he runs. Oh, I didn't train at all before that race. Exactly, but I think I can help you. Let's get back to work. Right. There you go, Ryan. 
one. First mile, eight flat. Seven flat. There you go, Ryland. Looking good. Looking good. Looking good. Ah, there you go. Seven flat. How was it, coach? Five minutes. I think you're ready. What an incredible race, and Ryland took home first place. With the help of coaching guru Caleb the Goose, Ryland finally understood what it meant to be a runner. Because Ryland won, the George Fox cross country team made the decision to add him as the newest member of their squad. He had made the team. The ceiling was the roof for Rylan as you look forward to new running achievements. And with that, the squad was ready to take on anyone. What a great story. Rylan had made it onto the team and he was well on his way to running at the professional level. There's a lot that we can learn from Rylan's story, however. Remember at the beginning, Ryland was learning a lot about running. He was reading the magazine, he learned what to wear, how to act, um, how to look like a runner. But he didn't actually go out and run. And so when he did his first race, he did really bad. In the same way, when Christians read the Bible, sometimes we know how to sound like a Christian, we know how to appease other Christians. We think that we can kind of look like a Christian. But what's most important is that we actually go out and act like a Christian. We do what Jesus says. And that's the point of this story. What we want to show you Cove Kids is the importance of not only reading scripture, we know it's important that we read scripture, just like it was important for Rowland to have read the magazine and know about running. But once we read scripture, it's not enough to just say, oh, I know what it says, but to actually go out and do it. So that's my challenge for you Cove Kids and for everyone else watching the service. Go out and do what scripture says. Thanks for watching, have a great Sunday, and keep making it happen.
Peace be with you. This is my greeting and my prayer this morning. So please join me as we pray for peace and we remember the kind of peace that God brought in Jesus and can continue to bring today. I'll leave some space, some open space for you to pray out loud wherever you are and I'll lead us. So join with me as we pray. God of peace. Please bring peace in our minds. We're worried. We're worried about the pandemic, about finances, about the future. Bring peace to our minds, Lord. God, bring your peace in our families. Bid our sad divisions cease in close quarters or separated by great distances. Come and be a healing salve in our families. Please bring peace in our bodies. You designed us and sustain us. Help our bodies to be whole and to work like you intended. Lord, bring your peace between all the peoples of this earth. People with different political parties, people of different races, people with different beliefs and religions, people in cities and rural areas, people with resources and those with nothing. Bring your peace between all people, God.
God, bring your peace in our hearts when we don't understand how the world works really and what our place in it is when our desire is to be fully with you now. Bring peace in our hearts. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. We remember the words of Jesus when he said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Help us to receive that word this morning, God. Amen. We have a new version of an old song to sing this morning. Um, if you've been around the cove for a while, you know that we sung this song quite a lot in the past. Um, the song is from Hillsong in Australia, and they have recently put out a new version of this song um, with an added bridge um, because it's just such a, such a great song and just so pertinent to this time. We're all needing some stillness and some peace from Christ. So I just wanted to forewarn you that there's going to be a new part if you know this song, so you're not jarred by that. But um, enjoy that. Enjoy that new meditation. And this is Still Peace.
Good morning, Cove. Good morning to all of you spread around our world somewhere. Good morning to those of you at home and to those of you here in our studio audience, which consists of Russell. So good morning to everyone. Some of us who are a little bit older remember when we were 16. I don't know if you remember when you were 16, but if you were like me, I was ready to be done with high school. I thought I was 16 going on 25 and just wanted to get moving with what I thought of as real life. Well, just about the time that I got my uh, permit, my driver's permit, it was a piece of paper, just a little card. And the driver's license in those days wasn't much more. It wasn't sophisticated like it is now. It was a piece of paper with a little, a very thin plastic laminated on front. And stories are told about this little trick you could do because it would have your age actually on there. And if you were very careful with an X-Acto knife, you could get yourself out of high school. You just take a little square cut out of that, and you take the six, and you flip it over to a nine, and you put it back in, a little bit of tape on the back, and I'm an adult, just like that, ready to go. You could be someone you weren't yet. Not saying I ever tried this myself, and not advising anyone to try this, but all of a sudden, you could be transported out of your situation and be much older. Now, I never had that uh, sort of thing scrutinized by an officer of the law or anything like that, but um, let's, some people say that worked. But I love our topic today, which is the story of Zacharias and what he said about his son, John, and, and Jesus. And as it turns out, we are all asking some of the same questions during this COVID time that Zacharias was asking well, exactly 2,020 years ago. Additionally, some of us are wondering when life is going to get back to normal. When are things going to stop being this way? And other Christians are asking too, are we on some sort of timeout from God? And when we're just all ready for this to be done. But what does God have for us? What does he have for us right now in the middle of all this? And secondly, what happens after this timeout period? What happens to us when this is all done? Does it make any difference to our life with God or to our society? Well, today we are quickly going to follow along with Zacharias for a year in his life because in many ways we are just like him. In fact, one could say he's a representative of people in general and God followers in particular. So you all may know, and by the way, uh, sometimes I slip. So Zacharias, Zachariah, uh, Zachariah, Zechariah, they're all the same. And different English translations have the name different. Um, so don't get confused because I read different translations and sometimes I get confused. So don't let me confuse you. Um, but John the Baptist, uh, Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, of course, was the one who prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus. And God found it important somehow through the authorship of Luke to provide this backstory to John, who was the backstory to Jesus. And it was, it was important to do. And one of the reasons I see for that is it, all of this is grounded in a particular time, in a particular place, in a geopolitical uh, situation, the, uh, geographical situation, sociological situation. All of this was was real and tangible. It wasn't an abstract or theoretical myth or um, religious uh, symbolism only. 
So Zechariah, or Zechariah, husband of childless Elizabeth, he was, of course, the priest who was selected by lottery to serve in the temple. And Dan touched on this in the last couple of weeks. So it was one particular day in his own life. And this was a big deal. It was a great honor, and it was a big celebration for the whole family that he was chosen for this. And Zechariah goes into the temple, and most of us know the story, but just to repeat a little bit, Zechariah goes into the temple, and while he's in there by himself, an angel appears to him and promises him a son. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless, like Abraham and Sarah and others before them. And, you know, really, this was the biggest blessing imaginable. But like a lot of us, Zechariah goes, really? He questions the angel, and he dismisses him by just kind of blowing it off and questioning him, and by extension, he's scoffing at God, really. And it's blessing beyond what he could have expected. And he goes, ah, yeah, right, right. What's going on here? But it reveals a couple of things about Zechariah's heart. And what it reveals is that <clears throat> he has lost hope in God. He has lost hope in ever having a child. And he has stopped trusting that God really has his best interest in mind. Moreover, we all can jump into that spot of stop trusting at times. We stop trusting that God really has our best interest in mind. And wow, I can be... I can do a better job with my own happiness than you can, God. So in the middle of this COVID thing, I'm wondering how, much of, how many of us have lost a sense of hope, have a little hopelessness. Zechariah sure had it. But as a result of this attitude and as a result of talking to this angel this way, <clears throat> he's struck dumb. He can't talk. And it's not as punishment or retribution. In the Bible, we don't see these things so much as that. But we see times like this as discipline so that we can learn to live a better way, so that we can learn to live more in the plan that God has for us. You know, in the beginning, God created us for what? He created us for blessing. He created us for intimacy with himself and the blessing of love, of a love relationship. That's what we're we're created for. And our greatest contentment is to be found in obedience to God. That's blessing. When our relationship is rightly aligned with God, that's our greatest source of joy. And that's why all throughout the Bible we see express praise to God, rejoice in God, rejoice, rejoice, it's all over. That sort of attitude is as much the bedrock of what our psyche and our mental state is supposed to be about as our DNA is to our biology. They, we have, but we've all, all of us have pulled this trick from time to time. And <clears throat> we end up in a place where we have this twisted nature. We doubt God's essential goodness. And boy, I'm guilty of this too. By my actions, I demonstrate that I'm doubting God's purpose with my best interest in mind. And that somehow being fully obedient to God will rob me of my happiness. Well, the story of Zacharias is a story of all of us. It's the background of Zacharias' life and by extension, the life of all the people of Israel that give color to what is going to come next in John the Baptist. So anyway, back to our story, Zechariah is struck dumb. God puts him on timeout for nine months. It's nine months of enforced silence. And he watched his growing baby and his wife during this nine months. You know, I don't know if any of you are very good at self-recrimination, but I have tuned it to a fine, fine art, I've got to tell you. Um, and I can just hear Zechariah's thoughts from 2,000 years ago as he's sitting there unable to speak in his little cage kind of thing. If it was me, <clears throat> I'd be saying, Janver, you idiot. How could you have argued with or questioned an angel? Why did you say that? What was the matter with you? That angel was bringing you great blessing. God was blessing you. And what did you do? You argued. Oh, and by the way, that 
angel could have had a flaming sword. You're lucky you only lost your speech and not your head. But during that nine months of pregnancy, God turned Zacharias while he was on timeout, while he was locked up, so to speak, he went from hopelessness to repentance, from repentance to hopeful, and from hopeful to joy. We know that because of what comes out of his mouth next. But all this time, Zacharias is, he's thinking about this baby like all parents. So I have this uh, business partner and uh, dear friend named uh, Bobby. And Bobby and his wife, Yali, are pregnant with their second child. And that, uh, as of this morning, Saturday, when we're doing this, putting this together, the baby's not here. It was due almost two weeks ago. So it should be here any day, and he's just taking his time. So they've already named him uh, Jeremiah. And Zacharias would have been in the same spot, thinking about this baby. Now, <clears throat> this baby, uh, Bobby and Yali's baby, is not uh, mine, but I kind of feel... I know them very well. I almost feel like an expected grandparent. I don't have any grandkids. And so it's like, boy, I'm thinking about this kid. We're praying for this little baby. We're praying for the whole family. We're just praying that he will walk with Jesus all the days of his life, that he will be a source of blessing to everyone around him, that he and his sister will just be totally sold out to Jesus. And we're praying for all these things, for health, for welfare, for hope, for that they will focus on the important things in their lives. Well, Zacharias would have been in that same spot during nine months. His baby was coming. At long last, this blessing, this baby. So the baby's born and circumcised on the eighth day per Leviticus. And it was traditionally, we know, that was the time when the baby was named also, when he's circumcised. And so in obedience to the instructions from the angel and in defiance of tradition, when he is handed this pad to write down the baby's name. He writes John. Not Zacharias' his own name, which would have been traditional, but John. So the Spirit of God has been working on old Zacharias for nine months. And then, when he can speak, here's what comes out of his mouth. <clears throat> Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. First thing out of his mouth, this is how we know about his attitude change moved by the Holy Spirit, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve them without fear, to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. These were the words that came right out after this nine months of incubation inside of Zechariah. He comes out and he has all these words about how God has been faithful for so long. This section is all about the nation of Israel. Whereas before we looked at um, Mary and how her, her song or sermon or psalm was, a, was personal, this is about the nation of Israel. And Zechariah, in his praise to God, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, he backs up through here and he starts walking through some of the specifics. And a lot of commentators have, um, they go back through these eight verses we just read and there are many, at least a dozen, some more, some say more, like two dozen references to Old Testament passages of how God was faithful. And so Zechariah rolls up millenniums of the nation's walk with God into these eight verses as a burst of praise. So he looks back at the nation's past, and then he's going to point the nation forward. But he gives thanks for sending a national redeemer and he recites God's original contracts with Abraham, Isaac, and David. A Abraham, Israel, and David. But twice he alludes to language from Psalm 106. So I'm just going to take a quick look at that. Psalm 106 is a brief history of the people um, prior to David. And the psalmist writes, 
Give thanks to the Lord. You may be familiar with this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And Psalm 106 is a, is a brief look at the cycles of obedience, discipline, repentance, and joy that the nation of Israel spent hundreds of years going through. So <clears throat> three times in this, chapter, or in this one chapter, the people forgot God. They would forget his provision. They would forget his miracles. They would forget his kindness. And then they would walk their own way. God would let them experience the result of that. And then they would get into a mess. They would repent, give glory to God, and then see blessing and joy in their lives again. And then they'd forget a little while later. Well, that whole picture that sometimes took hundreds of years, in Israel's case as a nation, took place here in a very short picture in Zechariah's life, just like in my own life and in your life. But he sums all this up. He starts off with this, but praise be to the Lord. So he looks back at the faithfulness of Israel, and then he looks forward and affirms the announcement of the angel as he speaks of his new son, this little baby, John. And he says this, You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. You know, this prophecy of Zacharias is borne out to be true as later Luke records how strong in the Spirit John was, how he walked full of the Spirit, how he was well-respected by all the people. He had a really widespread audience, and so when Jesus comes along, he has a platform to announce Jesus. He has a platform to verify who Jesus is. And so he's that human voice that's well-respected among the people. And when Jesus get there, gets there, he said, Hey, look, pay attention. Here he is. This is the Messiah. The Jews at that time were living in the dark shadow of Herod's Jerusalem, and the Lord did not disappoint them. It's kind of interesting that the Lord called Israel to be a priestly nation. He set the Hebrew people aside to be his own people. And part of their role was to live godly lives, to teach scripture, to exude joy, to serve out of love, to do acts of mercy. This is who Israel was supposed to be. This was God's intention for them. And it's always interesting to me to see, to look at a map and see how centrally located Israel, this little country, smack dab in the middle of these crossroads of people for trade, for uh, war sometimes, but people going through. And by design, they were to be the light of the world as a nation, but they stumbled over and over again. And whether it's Israel as a nation or Zacharias personally, because of their lack of belief, they failed to fulfill their obligation God would put this group on a timeout for discipline, not for retribution, so that they could once again live in joy, so that they could once again live in the fullness of light, so that they could once again believe truly in their hearts that God was working for their best, that he had their best, that God was working for their joy, for this joy-love relationship. Early on, when I was uh, working in construction, I was uh, building a house 30-plus oh, years ago in uh, Hollister, California, of all places. And um, I remember this little incident to this day. In, uh, at that time, it was, it was before, it was right when batteries powered screwdrivers were coming out. And uh, we had these things called Yankee screwdrivers. They were about this long. And there was this apparatus, and you'd push on it, and it would spin the bit at the end. And it was really kind of the way to put screws in instead of this. You could do this, and uh, no batteries required. And, um, but then battery screws, screwdrivers came out. 
And <coughs> the, um, the boss of this uh, electrical company, Foreman, he came out to the job site and uh, he, uh, he tried to give um, the three electricians who were there to wire the house that I was building, he tried to give them battery screwdrivers, like brand new. They were Makitas at that time and um, there was kind of the thing, they had a big long handle on them and stuff. And I still could see the picture. Those guys did this. Their union had told them not to, not to use these things, and they weren't going to, because in fear, they were afraid it was going to take jobs away. And so instead of taking the gift that was ultimately going to serve them, they refused to take the gift that was meant for their blessing, but it didn't work. They just didn't want it. And like a lot of people in the trades, um, if you work with your hands long enough, um, like me and countless others and other people who have repetitive injuries, we end up with surgeries on your hands and different things in order to fix the different things. It was actually for their benefit. It was to bless them, and they put their hands in their pockets. Boy, that picture stays with me and how often I have put my hands in my pocket when God has something for my benefit. But I can just imagine Z, as we mentioned, his angst at his own behavior as he sees the baby developing, how he must have prayed and repented silently. But still, even though he had repented, he was unable to speak. Yet we know from the psalm that came out and the prophecy that came out of his mouth that he didn't lose hope. He was still praising God. And so a couple of observations come from this. You know, you, know, you may be in that place of discipline. You may be on the bench. I know I've been there for sure. Um, yet God's promise, they keep us hoping. They keep us going. They were keeping the, the nation of Israel going as they looked for the Messiah and looked, for, looked at the prophecies uh, most recently in the book of Malachi a few hundred years before then. But God had promised a forerunner who would announce the Messiah. And here he was. The people were hoping. Zechariah was hoping. I'm hoping. Discipline is not punishment, it's for our benefit. It's for restoration of our joy. And so in our COVID isolation or the, whatever your situation is, I want to say do not lose hope. Rather, this attitude, God, what do you have? When relief comes, it's time to praise God with hats off, but it's for joy. This is for joy. This time that we're in is for joy, never for bitterness. And one of the things that it does is it frees us from old patterns. It allows us to refocus on God's best for us, to strip away practices and habits that, we, that are not necessarily honoring to God, things that enslaved us, so that we can carry on with greater joy when, it finally, when this is finally over. When growth occurs... God's lessons in us are worked out. And when these lessons are worked out, we are transformed. And then, and then, our legacy is established. Only after that. The legacy of Zacharias is something that we all know. That he was not faithful, and then he was faithful, and he came back to God, and he followed through, and now he had a son who was John the Baptist, and he announced the way of Jesus. That's Zechariah's legacy. And this is, it was developed during this time he was on time out. But just because he repented while he was on time out, his term wasn't over. What was over was his disbelief. What was over was his disappointment. But what could he do when he couldn't talk? What he could do is he could rejoice. What he could do is he could praise. What he could do is he could let God be God in his own life and say, Your will, Lord, not mine. What he could do is let his legacy develop. And he could believe again that God is good, that God is for us, that his interest is for us. Well, when he was ready, God calls him off the bench with this prophecy. And because of this, he prophesies over his son, and he helps to set up his son to prepare the way for Jesus. Tremendous legacy. To give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sin. Because of the tender mercy 
of our God. So my question to me and my question to you is simply this. Feeling unworthy, feeling frustrated, feeling tired of all of this, wondering when we can get back together, boy, I am too. But here's what we can do. We can rejoice. We can praise. We can let God be God in our life and say, Lord, your will in me. Strip away all the other stuff. That's what we can do today. Strip away all the other stuff. You lead me, Lord. You can, we can be in the spot of letting our own legacy develop, how we handle this time, how we trust God during this time. It's what happens after this that defines us or during this that defines us, not anything that came before. No matter our checkered past, which we all have, that doesn't define us. And most importantly, we can believe again that God is good, that God is here, that he is for us. As we look at this whole picture here, we see that because of the tender mercy of God, He's shining on those living in darkness. feels like a dark day to me right now. He's shining his light in the shadow, those living in the shadow of death. God is for us. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your love for us that just will not let us go. And Lord, I confess that I let go of you all the time. And I get my eyes distracted And I start wavering and I start thinking, God, are you good? Is this really your best? And I take some steps that are off and, Lord, for each of us, bring us to yourself freshly that you are good, that we can proclaim out loud, that we can take great joy in you today. And we do take great joy in you today, Lord. In Jesus' name, we give you honor and praise, our Father in heaven. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light and from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the Father, praise the Son, praise
Just a couple of announcements before we close. The uh, St. Nick's Project is uh, due today, Sunday, if you can get that in. And then also the Women's Tea is today also at 1 o'clock here on Sunday. Let's just uh, stand, if you are able, where you are for the benediction. Jesus has come into this world because of the tender mercy of God the Father, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is our legacy. Praise be to God.